Hello and welcome to the Grade Cricketer Podcast. On today's show, Bradman's first pitch is under the threat of developers. Australia becomes the first team to win in England since weird records with eight caveats began. We review the summer of English bubbles. The IPL has started and we forecast what cricket looks like in the future. Shane Lee is on the show to take us back to the 1990s Australiana. Zach Crawley is on the show to discuss his tall, weird-looking runs. That's all before we get into hashtag RCGC, which hints... At more Bearstow stories, playing a five-a-side against deaf blokes and distracting yourself during sex. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler. We can get your customized face masks at budgiesmuggleruk.com. Don't forget to use the checkout Pezzy Lad Champ for free shipping. You can also find more exclusive content every single week at patreon.com forward slash grade cricketer. More good stuff coming up there. My name is Ian Higgins. Someone on the internet called me Rig Rat. Yeah. Higrat. Hippopotamus. I'm joined by Pezzy Lad, Sam Perry, Pezzy Lad, Pezzypotamus, Pezdo Pasta. Hello. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good start to the week, this. 11 cases? Is, are you referring to the coronavirus? No, just, no. just us doing the show, just yeah. having a chat. Yeah, of course. Um, got a couple of good guests on. We've already interviewed Shane Lee this morning. Mm-hmm. He gave us some insights into Steve War stuff, a couple of 90s stories, show about so, was involved, playing Warnie. in the backyard. Yeah, Warney, Brett yeah, Lee, Brett obviously Lee. involved. Bit of Brett Lee, backyard bingo. Yeah, we're talking to Zach Crawley this evening, so that hasn't happened yet, but I'm looking forward to Zach because I just want to have a little, just a little look inside. We talked about Zach a few weeks ago. Yeah. We also put in a request for him. We wondered whether that would, request would be denied off the yes. back of saying he scored tall, which was therefore weird runs. Yes. So we're going to find out tonight. Yeah. I, I, to I distanced myself from your remarks in regards to his runs. When it's controversial, it's we. And mm. when either of us do something good, it's I. You know? Pez, many things to talk about on the show. But, yes. but Patreon, there's things happening this week. We want to talk about the Patreon because there's good things happen behind there. Yes, uh, you know, every week we've been talking about, oh, the RTGC Fridays are so good. They are good, they're, they're dark, they're loose. They're Someone said we should call RTGC Raw. It's probably a better name than RTGC Fridays, yeah. but don't tell us what to do. Don't tell us what to um, do. Even though it's a better idea. Stay in your fucking lane. Stay in your lane. And that's the sort of vibe you can expect when yep. you sign up to Shut Patreon. The fuck up. Exactly. Fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, fuck out of here. With your, with your ideas, with your superior yeah. ideas. We're yeah. two blokes. Yeah, with your Can't bigger brands. That. Yeah give us better ideas and expect it to accept it publicly. Mm. Mm. Anyway, next week it'll be called RTGC Royal. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. got to – I read some comments out last week. You guys, do you want to read comments? Let's just change the voice on this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's um, – uh, these podcasts are an absolute breath of fresh air. Congrats, Tit Rat and Pez Dispenser. Mm. Love these pods. Cheers, Pezdo Pasta and the Hippopotamus. There's a community that's being built yeah. here. I am crying. Thank you. <laughs> Holy shitballs. This is peak TGC. I had to pause that last story so I didn't crash my car. Absolute tears. These are the kind yeah. of things that are happening on Patreon. Yeah. Sure. Questions, like cricketer. Week, questions last week about, you know, dad, man, cads, water, polo, just yes. the normal stuff. This week, very happy to say, this week we are going to so, – so listeners may have remembered a few weeks ago. They may recall. They may recall we put up a bonus interview with Zorba, with Adam Zampa. Yes. It was loose. It was rare. It was talking about New South Wales being the best, you know, him growing hemp. Yep. Just the normal stuff <laughs> from Australia's leg spinner mm. in short formats. Yeah. Uh, this week, we're putting up another extended interview. So you guys would have listened to us talk to Harry Conway a few weeks ago. The second half of that, looser stuff, mm. is on Patreon. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's coming up this week. That's what you get when you go to patreon.com slash greatcricketer. You're going to get dream analysis. You're going to get some long-form stuff. You're going to get RT to see Friday. The entire arch- archive opens up to you. It's not attached to the news cycle. It's just pure grade cricket looseness, if that's what you're after. There's also a running series of questions happening at the moment with a guy blowing raspberries on a girl during oh, yeah. a... During a um, Fornication, uh, a sexual tryst. Yeah, a chop that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you use the uh, scientific language, I use the TJC language. Hey, Pez. Yes. Um, now, Don Bradman is a name you may recall. He played cricket for Australia uh, in the 40s, I think it was. Um, now, his childhood pitch could be lost, apparently, yeah. to some housing development. Yeah. Have you come across this story? Uh, I have. This is a report in the ABC uh, with great... Uh, I guess alarm as mm. there should be. Can you tell the listeners about what their story is about? I've sort of top lined that, but what's 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 it really about? Oh, no, look, it's that, a human interest that, story. That's pretty much. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that's pretty much it. Okay. There's a pitch, a concrete pitch. Oh, it's concrete in Barrel in the Southern Highlands. It's a road. Uh, where it well, that's mm. the question, and we're going to go into that. <laughs> um, but it may be lost for housing development. Uh, yeah. Now there's a picture. So and this was um, reported on by Chloe Hart, I believe. That's the top of my head. I'm sorry, Chloe, if I got that last name wrong. Mm-hmm. But Chloe Hart and uh, interviews a whole bunch of different people who. Um, you know, who, who have 
left us now, but who played with Bradman. It sort of suggested this pitch is where Bradman played after school on a Wednesday afternoon mm. uh, in high school. Mm. Uh, uh, it was behind the church yeah. where it was said he was on grooming cold, his talent. So I'm like, I don't use the word groom. Uh, yeah, not, yeah, um, but yeah, that's yeah. a separate issue. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and, and so – They've now heritage listed this because some property developers want to come in and, of course, build units, make a lot of money, capitalist society, et cetera. Yes. You know? um, capitalism versus Bradman, what are we going to do? So, mm-hmm. you know, what we want to answer <laughs> was more important. Well, the Bradman Museum is, yeah, you, you, can have, you can have your cake and eat it too is what I'm trying to say. So apparently you may have played on this pitch in high school, right? According to mates, he absolutely dominated these kids in high school. A couple of mates have now left yes. us saying stuff like uh, – On the cricket field. Uh, you know, I played cricket with Don Bradman. We played at the back of the Church of England there. Uh, his childhood friend, childhood friend Harry Smith said in 94, we were right in the outfield. Bradman would hit one there and you'd run over and he'd beat you to the boundary. Bradman was all over you. Yeah. There's a couple of things. Is he's he, going on is, there. Is Bradman chasing the ball to the boundary? Is he? Yeah. I mean, he mustn't. This guy's 94 when he's talking about this. So <laughs> yeah. he's just saying he's all over us. And isn't his name he's, just Harry Smith? Harry I mean, Smith. Oh, just, yeah. yeah, Harry Smith. Harry Smith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's just a bloke. Yep doing his best. Um, So uh, the thing about this is, firstly, you have a look at this pitch, right? Yeah. uh, Give the grass around it a mow if you care about it that much. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Any danger of a fucking snipper? Yeah. Anyway, how much do you care about it? So there's that. Give it a fucking – I mean, Bradman never went aerial. So if you can actually reproduce it, he wouldn't have hit boundaries with the way that grass is. So there's firstly, give it a fucking mow. I need to show – I think maybe for maybe for our YouTube audience, I might post a picture Mm. of of what this pitch looks like because it's a fucking disgrace. It's the most like unkept – like think of like what your balls might look like before Manscaped. (laughs) Yes. We were not promoting this 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 week. I lost my cord and had to ride into the (laughs) – and then I found it. It was my son hit it. I've turned, I've turned this into a manscaped dad. It's, it's not a manscaped dad. Yeah, some. yeah. But if you are a sponsor, that's the sort of love you're going to get. Um, <laughs> the, ha, however, even though it seems a very strange and kind of like really, um, what's a word, like sentimental piece about keeping, you know, the treasure of Bradman's yeah. memory alive yeah, 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 or whatever, yeah. Yeah. like – there is a good reason to keep it alive. Now, Why is that? Because this story is about Bradman brutalising children with his own run scoring. Now, like, on the cricket field. On the cricket field as in high school. Now, like, And you've got his mate Harry Smith talking here. Now yeah. Bradman's hit 334 at Leeds. He's got the 270 where he didn't make a mistake. Yep. 254. These yeah. are in test, Four, ma- these are in test matches. Yeah. Imagine what he was doing against high school kids. Well, he's chasing the ball to the boundary for He's chasing start. the boun- ball to the yeah. boundary, getting it back, hitting yeah. more runs. I mean, he would have scored hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of runs, right? Yeah. And Australia needs this at this moment in time, especially mm. in cricket. We need to preserve the memory mm. of ruthless batsmanship, bordering Bra- on kind of spectrum stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Bradman, we need it. Brahman was the first, you know, Indian kid who hits 1,400 in a school game. He was the original Instagram celebrity. That's right. With a, yeah. But you can't tell me that there isn't a direct correlation between that kind of culture, that kind of batting, yeah. and the success that we had in the 90s and the 80s. You know, it runs all mm. the way through. We need to develop more children mm. who destroy other children on the field okay. and do it without any fear or favour. Right. Now we're okay. developing children then allowed, I presume. And, of course, you know, there's a few programs out there around helping everyone have a going kids cricket and stuff like that. I agree with that. But once they get to that age where they can just hit hundreds and yeah. do it forever, yeah. go for it. I think that we've all played against a kid in the backyard or like just in a school game, whatever, that he's just getting a bit too involved. And Bradman's that guy, obviously, mm. he's hitting the ball and he's chasing, he's, he's chasing, he's <laughs> chasing, fuck off. I was, never, I was always that kid. <laughs> <laughs> Bradman's hitting balls and he's chasing it to the boundary himself. Like, Pick a fucking position, man. Yeah. Like you can't – oh, is he bowling it as well or is it just T-ball now? But I, I – <laughs> imagine if they found out he was just playing T-ball. But uh, <laughs> That would be a surprise. I encourage it. Like we need to develop more of that attitude in, okay. our, in our like junior high school children. Yeah. I think. And that's why this pitch needs to be protected. Now what I'd like to do, I'd like them to actually give it a mo. Um, you know, we need more of this in our batting. Like, it's a side of cultural significance for this reason. Like, um, if anyone's batting is struggling, you could actually do tours to, to this. You know, you could see, like, rather than the Australian team going to Gallipoli, they yeah. just go to this ground. They go to right? You know, and they'd be told stories of Bradman dominating limp roosted juniors. Yes. Uh, it's like the empty library, the bibliotheque in Berlin, you know, the sculpture with an empty Is bookcase it? underground where we're commemorating Nazi book burning and the, and the perils of that. We could do tours right. of that, we, of Bradman's ground. This is, this is what you want to preserve. Okay. So that's the four of the preservation of it. Or, mate, I'm looking at this pitch and I'm like, mate, you hit the nail on the head at the beginning. Give it a fucking mo if you yeah. care about it. I mean, the state of this yeah. thing, it's just like, it's like, 
it's like a destitute um, dystopian world, like a cut scene from um, um, that movie with Mel Gibson that I can't think of on the top of my head. Are you thinking Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams? I am now. Yeah. <laughs> well, he has a farm and, it's actually, and he actually builds it into a baseball field. Oh, if yeah, you build right. it, he will come. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, it's just dilapidated at the moment. Make yeah. a ground out of it. Mm. Get some holograms going. Get a few kids to actually pretend now are Bradman. You mm. know, do do a few shows, you know. I just I just look at this thing. It was just like, that's just someone's old backyard. I don't care if Bradman played in this concrete thing. It's like mm. it's just a strip of this. Uh, it just it looks terrible. I don't give a fuck. Think of the people that can live there, move into the community, celebrate think Bradman the, as a whole. Think though, of the money pairs. that could be made as well. But the money can be made by going to the Bradman Museum, bring more people into the community. They go to the Bradman Museum, might just buy, you know, buy a shirt. And we do some shows down there. It's a very, it's very corporate comms here. He's like, well, what we're going to do is we're going to build high-rise apartments. Many yes. people will live there. The profits will then partly be reinvested back into grid clubs where we'll make great facilities. Oh, I didn't say that. They keep the profits themselves. <laughs> Fuck distributing. <laughs> oh, no, say we do it. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, okay, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we move that money to offshore yeah. bank accounts. Yeah, offshore bank accounts. Yes. Tax and then we start developing children in a lab in Wuhan. <laughs> And now some biological warfare is yeah. in play here. That's mm. what Bradman would have wanted. That's what he would have wanted. And a, maybe a hook shot. Yeah. He struggled yeah. against body line. He averaged 50. Weak. No wonder he's fucking banning a concrete pitch in high school. Jardine was right. So it's a good tactic. Jardine was right. And he was Just bump him. Just bump the bloke. Come around the wicket. Come around. The le- those, those fields were a little bit leg side, to be fair. They were yeah. like, how many leg gullies do you need? <laughs> Four? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, okay. Jardine was right. Yeah. So that's our that's our take on Bradman. That's it. That's that's the take. I just think fucking I don't know. It, whatever. Oh, if they're going to preserve it, just do a little bit with it. Do it up. Put a little, put a little bit of lipstick on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, mate. Australia won the third ODI game, which feels like it was about six years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they became the first team to beat England in a three game ODI series <laughs> since 2015. Yeah. Yeah. It's like something that you should almost care about, but I mean, have England lost a five game or a four game series? I don't, I don't know. The first, statistic is very specific. It was bilateral since 2015. Right? But saying that, like England are a really good team cool. and um, and Australia beat them without Steve Smith, but England didn't have Stokes. I don't, I don't know. It just seems like it's a good win. It's good. It's a good win. They're trending up, Australia. Leah, yeah, they, they won yeah, three. Yeah, um, trending up. See it as a whole. It was T20 games, then ODIs. They right. won, Australia won three out of those six games. Yeah. And they'll probably think they threw two of those away. That's right. But then they secure victory. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, they'll probably think we played the better cricket for more periods of time. Swings and roundabouts. Um, probably more of a four out of six victory, four, four games out of six they should have had. Right. They could have, they could have won both series. Yeah. Uh, well, a year they'll ago, be kicking though, themselves, Pez, that they didn't oh, I'm win so, that I'm sure they will yeah. in their hazmat suits going over the IPL. But, um... <laughs> Yeah. A year ago, Fuck, like, that looks weird. The World Cup, like for the Aussie team, it felt like a year ago. It felt like the World Cup was an afterthought. You know, they were getting over sandpaper. They're just trying to get the What's test team cool going, yeah. and they're like, "Listen, we, you know, we can alpha our way to a semi with Warner Hundred Stark Yorkers, yeah. um, Ponting's forearms on camera. That's just 100%. how we're going to get to the semi. See yeah. what happens. Okay, England won, Soviet. <laughs> right? But it was just, just alpha our way. There. We need Ponting's forearms involved. It seems like they're a more thoughtful, more planned side. Australia they almost now. Like care about they, it. They've more. got. But they've got like Andrew McDonald and Trent Woodhill involved, you know, some like short yeah, yeah. form experts that talk about all those wonk elements of short form cricket you meant to talk about now. Wonk? You know, yeah, wonkish, yeah, policy wonks, you know, like ma- matchups here and like little um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. weird stuff there. Like, you know, they're, they're on the up, probably well positioned for the next World Cup right. um, if they can sort out their middle order. I remember in the Amazon documentary where they're talking about during the World Cup and they were like, they picked, um, what's his name? Um, Who's a left arm quick? Who I can't think of anyone's name today. Berendorf. Berendorf, thank you. They picked him in the semi final or the or the, the the group game. They right. picked him because Bearstow or Root, one of the two, struggles mm. against left armers, and they got, he got him out early. And it's just like that level of research is yeah, like if that applied to great cricket, they were like just bowl at the stumps this bloke. Yeah, he'll miss it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just bowl stump to stump, have a ring field. <laughs> yeah, make sure that person's twenty eight years old. But it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just broke up. Yeah, works in the mines. <laughs> Got a really good car and some good stories and a couple of dark things about a couple them. Of, yeah. A couple of skeletons yeah. from their early 20s. That's yeah. why they don't play ones anymore. After two drinks, quite funny. <laughs> That's yeah. Give them three. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Don't, dro- don't drive home tonight, Andrew. Nah. <laughs> that was Andrew. That was Sam's Andrew. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, hey, Adam Zampa bowled pretty well. He's yeah. the first person. Here's another record, which don't mean anything, I think. He's the first Australian spinner to get 10 wickets in a three-game ODI bilateral series. Mm. But interesting, isn't it? Because, like, you, you can look at Zampa and you're just like, I don't know what he does with it. He seems to get a lot no, of wickets that? of blokes trying to take him down. That's mm. like he's got Coley out, what is it, 185 times now or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I think it's that, yeah. And a Coley a lot of times is attacking him. He gets a lot of wickets when blokes are attacking him, but he's got four, three, three wickets. He's actually – um. He's probably come out of this series 
better than anyone in terms Definitely. of securing his place. Slowish start in the T20s and then yeah. was just taking lots of wickets and yeah. was the go-to bowler. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think our understanding of leg spin here or like wrist spin is, is worn. It's, it's still you know, worn, big, yeah. Big yeah. side spin. Worn it's McGill. drift. Lloyd it's Pope. V- violent stuff. It's Lloyd Pope, World Cup under-19s yeah, against, yeah, against yeah. England. Yeah. It's, you know, everything you do is got to be – It's worn McGill and Lloyd Pope. It's got to be It's got to be wrong and it's got to be humiliation. Humiliation. All that kind of stuff. Like yeah. we don't really like the – the, the fast into the wicket bowlers. New age, um, new age bowlers. Yeah, and, and Zampa is a little bit like that in those shorties. It sort of slide into the wicket, but yeah, he's yeah. developing a wrong and a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he's getting better. And he talks to us, so we're always going to say the right thing. We're not compromised at all. Ah, it's nice to see friends do well, isn't it? Mm. Hey, uh, Glenn Maxwell got man of the series. Uh, now, I said last week that I wasn't sure about Maxwell, and he scored this a wonderful 100. And you know what? You said more than it. Uh, still not that. fucking sure. I'm still not sure. Stand by that. It's the best time to stand by Mate, criticism. Records suggest, okay, he batted so well, probably hit the hundred. Hard here. Probably hit the hundred. Yeah, fuck this bloke. Yeah, no, yeah. doing you know. a real grade cricket style. Ah. Like double down. Mate, he should have fucking apologised yeah. to yeah. the team. Yeah. Mate, the amount of times I heard someone like score a hundred in grade game, and then like someone on our team would be like, that bloke should apologise to us for like, making us watch him bat. It's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> You've never hit a hundred in your life, you kid. Anyway, um... <laughs> flashback. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm back. Um, and I'm in Melbourne for some reason. Um, yeah, so Glenn Maxwell, look, he's he's hit a man of the series. So he hit that 70 in the first game, batted really well with Mitchell Marsh. He's basically won two games for Australia. Yeah, and I did not see that coming. So like, yeah. so law of averages suggests that he won't score any runs but in the times that matter. Now, I'm not saying these games don't matter, but I'm also kind of saying like bilateral cricket in ODI, in ODI series. Like, what, like ODI cricket now, and now I'm going in tangent, is like one tournament every four years. I agree. One tournament in four years. Like rugby. But then when the World Cup is on, like that was that was that was cool last year. That was a really cool tournament, and ultimately the best team, yeah, the best team won. But that that side it was a great spectacle, and like World Cups, they are cool, they are good. But the rest of it is like it's just TV money, isn't it? That's what this is about. And so, can Glenn Maxwell score those runs at a time? Can he be relied upon in like those really pivotal pivotal moments? I don't know. But fuck, he's good to watch when he hits boundaries. It's an unfortunate part of our culture that we can like only confer trust when you've done it in a tough situation or in a world cup win but me a world thing, cup or fuck off but you could argue he's already done that 20 he did That's it in the 20, dumbest thing i've ever said <laughs> <laughs> he did it in, he did it in 2015 um it's in, he's the fastest of 3000 runs he's he's so great is that he's right yeah. fastest 3000 runs um sorry what is it the fewest fewest fuel, balls Oh, face. okay, right. So, highest strike rate to get the 3,000 yeah. runs. Uh, for 3,000 runs. One of the more revered statistics. Um, I think, like, the interesting thing about Maxwell is, well, there's lots of interesting things about him. Yeah. But, like, I feel like in this parallel universe, like, Glenn Maxwell is meant to sort of redefine the game of cricket. Yeah, like, yeah. it's meant to be built around. Like, kind of like Saywag? What well, Saywag did a bit? I just think he, like, he's so. Um, obsessed in a very cool way about doing things that nobody's done before Mm -hmm. of like redefining it, exquisite unseen talent, taking it to places we've never seen like a revolutionary. He's a fucking worldie. No doubt. He's a worldie. No doubt. But, but instead he's like coming to the Australian cricket team and we're like, what your reverse sweep is like your cover drive. You say, fuck out of here, get your elbow up. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I feel like he does really well when the team's built around him, when it's about Maxwell, which is cool. But when he's got to be a floater, or a, a you know, hole plugger, a problem fixer, hole plugger. it just doesn't seem to fit the identity as much. Like I just, you just got to make it all about Maxwell, I'm not, and it's quite difficult to do that in the current Australian side. Yeah, that is true. Do you remember last year in the World Cup when it was uh, we're trying to figure out like how many balls he could face? Like that was his, that was the yeah. optimal thing. So he's like, because in, in, in this game where he got the hundred, he was batting at seven beneath Carey. Who I think as well, we're gonna maybe get on to Kerry, but I reckon Kerry might have been a little bit playing for his place, given that oh, Wade definitely. is in the squad as well. And like, definitely. But, but, but Kerry was probably our best batsman in the World Cup last year. Yeah. Um, and then I suppose he hasn't played a lot of international cricket since then, but you know, he was gonna be, he was vice captain of the ODI squad. He was mm. sort of like a little bit hinted, a little bit of a wink and a mm. nod of like, oh, Tim Payne might retire soon, get Kerry mm. in, and he'll captain the side. And then it's like he's sort of fallen away. Anyway, so Maxwell was coming in at seven, and it's like, mm. it's an interesting player, it's an interesting spot to have. Um, one of your best batsmen or your most destructive batsmen mm-hmm. at seven. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to figure out, like, what is his best spot. But, like, Well, I think I, he's I meant to be there to face 20 balls and get the most out of those balls. But then he's come in and, and literally won the game. Now, I mean, you know, we don't need to question Maxwell for the next World Cup because he's going to be in the side, especially after doing that. And I think within that team yeah, yeah. it's going to be, like, 
I think their their thought is okay. We're resetting. We're going to the World Cup in in India, and now we've just knocked off the number one team in England, regardless yeah. of whether it's a bilateral and no one's at the ground and everyone's afraid of a virus. Um, rightly so. Yeah. Like Maxwell was the was the linchpin and the player of the series in the team that has kind of reset them heading to the World Cup. So yeah. it's, Maxwell's there and he's part of it. It's just going right. to be very you know, un, you know, unfortunately with us. And Australia, like, there's always going to be a little bit of a question mark over whether he's going to deliver when we need it. And unfortunately, mm. that's not going to be until India 2023. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, that's true. I think until then, just enjoy it. It is well. That's a good. That's probably the best way to look at it. It's amazing because, uh, as I say, he's a fucking worldie. Mm. But it's just like I just want to see him do the worldie things a bit more often. Because mm. you're Australian and you grew up. Because I'm Australian, and I think he's Bradman. I want to you know, preserve mm. his backyard mm. pitch mm. on a concrete road or whatever mm. the fuck. Um, anything else to touch on there for that ODI series, mate? That game three in the ODI series. I mean, yeah, sort of touch on um, Carey there because like Wade is in the squad as well. Wade opened the batting in the third T20. Fuck this. This series feels like so long ago. Yeah. Wade played a good shot off Joffre. I like yeah. him that Wade. I, I, I like him in and yeah. around the side. Same. Just get him on the show. Get him on the show. Well, to that effect, mate, it might wrap up the English summer, yeah. as it were, because it's a bit of a funny series. Like this this ODI series and this T20, these six games that Australia played in England, Pezzy lad, mm. um, wasn't supposed to happen. And the sort of like just came out of the end there. And it's a really funny thing to think about this English summer as a whole and what we've taken away from it, if anything – um, other than maybe that, um, fuck, it was nice to have it on TV for a bit. Well, it was just good Good that they stood it up and we could watch it. I mean, I think that's the main thing. The West Indies took a 50% pay cut yeah, to play. It's amazing. It's incredible getting to – So again, I could have a rosé on a Wednesday night exactly. and a drunk tweet. Yeah, so we could watch TV shows while we yeah, were Yeah, we watch TV shows. It was a TV show. That's why sport exists. And Jason Holt is one of the great characters. You know, that, that yeah. feels like a really long time ago now. That but, does. you know, yeah, big wickets, great with Mike in hand. Mm. You know, we got to see – um, Stuart Broad deal with convulsions after being dropped yes. and bowl really well with his legs pumping. Yep. Jo- Zach Crawley defied things that we said, and we'll speak yep. to him soon mm-hmm. uh, about that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll make him apologise for the we'll run. Yeah, <laughs> ask him what he thinks about scoring tall runs. That'll go well, no doubt. <laughs> what, what do you mean? What do you just say? What do you mean? <laughs> it's just my height. Yeah. <laughs> What do you want me to do about that? Yeah. I'm just tall. Yeah. Yeah. It feels a bit weird. Yeah. Are you tall, are you, mate? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't worked out how to word the question, but <laughs> well, yeah. find out. Do you feel like you discriminated against me? <laughs> <laughs> not gonna... Don't you reckon you're a bit Matt Redshawry? Yeah. <laughs> tall people are batters, you know. Have doesn't... you thought about how Hayeswood's just going to nick you off? Yeah. You're going to ask him that? Yeah, just sledging a bloke who's yeah. very generously yeah. going to come really on the show. Him. Yeah. Well, so far, he says he is. <laughs> uh, Anderson got, you know, whatever, wickets. He got his broad. wickets staff broad, said he doesn't care about getting the wickets, and then he got the wickets. Anderson got whatever wickets. <laughs> so this is a good show. Welcome. Disrespectful. Chris Wokes did some stuff. Yeah. He's just good looking. Yeah. Chris Wokes might have been the player of the summer for in England. Think like what he did in that test match against Pakistan, come from behind. He played really well in the um, – he opened the bowling in the T20s mm. and the ODIs, batted well, scored some runs. He's probably mm. he's probably been the best player this summer. Mm. Oh, Baba, you know. Oh, Baba. Oh, Baba. What a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the Baba Razam train, man. I'm not on it. No, uh, no. Like the, it, it looks the, nice. The thing that the conversation he's like, oh, he's the, he's the fourth best batsman in the world. Fuck out of here. Is he? I don't. I don't know who the fourth best yeah. bat is, but I don't think it's Baba. Just because he played like he's played ten good games. Like Labuschagne's played ten good games, but is he the fourth best batsman in the world? No, he's he's as much in that conversation. Is Baba is Baba Azam, who is exquisite to watch when we get to watch him as a top three country, and the others yes. don't come out as much, so we're privileged and stuff. Yes. Is, he, is he the hipster's choice? As in, is he the choice of fourth best bat for the person to say what I really mean to say is I watch a little bit of cricket outside the top three? Yes, I think so. But he fucking looks good when you see him. He is a good player, no yeah. doubt. It's one of the great shames. We'll talk about the IPL in a second that there's no Pakistani players <clears throat> in the IPL. They just don't – they're not they're not allowed to play in it. So I'm not a bit unsure of the IPL in that respect. But I was lo- looking into this. So after the um, – we're going to – actually, we can just get into the IPL now, I suppose, if that's all right with you. It um, is, yeah. <clears throat> and thank you for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the IPL, so – the 26 – they're called the 2611 attacks. Do you know about this? It's the, the Mumbai attacks in 2008 – um, and apparently the, the, the people who did that were of Pakistani origin or heritage. Right. I'm, I'm really um, bastardizing the story. And, That's and right, right. It's, not, it's not a big well, story. Well, it's not a big story. It's just yeah. terrorism. Just whatever. Just affected the country. But you know, since then, there have been no Pakistani players playing in the IPL. But oh, in the first IPL auction, like Akhtar was in it, um, 
um, Yusuf Yuhana, I think, um, uh, Shahid Afridi, like all these players, but then ever since then, never. And then Barbara Zam's obviously number one T20 player in the world, and he doesn't get to play in the IPL because of that. So it's pretty fucked up, isn't it? Mm, I suppose so. Um, so IPL has commenced, Pez. The, the matches have started. And I kind of want to know what you think about the IPL in terms of like, what do you want to get out of it as a viewer? Now, the problem that we've spoken about in the past, Pez, the thing with the IPL that we haven't really taken seriously in Australia, I feel like as Australian audiences, it, it's, on a, it's on a bad times to watch. It's on at like one in the morning, that kind of stuff, two in the morning. It's not very friendly for Australian audiences. Do you reckon we would get more into it if it was at a good time in Australia? More do you so. think that's I, in? Definitely. I've got more so. so, but like I think so, yeah. how much is it? critical that you know our cricket stories essentially feature and focus on the national element of it well yeah it's, it's all it's all nationalism that's what the big bash is it's all yeah. it's all like if you put IPL flag. on prime time and all cricket aficionados tell you this is the best tournament for skill uh, undoubtedly the big bash is the fifth or sixth yeah in a row but you're watching Kolkata versus mm. Mumbai yeah. Delhi yeah or whatever mm-hmm. um do you, you know, think you know more that, of a night riders guy but yeah yeah like I still think it's and probably more of a commentary on Australian audiences. I still think that unless it had some Australian, you know, <laughs> focused Australian flavour, we're still going to be a little bit like, hmm, you know, it's because it, because it, it just hmm. shows that cricket or maybe sport is still about narrative. It's about the neighbours esque drama that you can kind of build <laughs> up with it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, you're right because the this is the best competition. It is. It's, it's incredible. Cricket. How much but, of it do you watch? But. How grim is it sometimes to watch cricket in India? Just the lights are a bit dimmer. The ball, the ball just doesn't get up as much. Doesn't get but up as much. The, it's like uh, watching games of the MCG. Hey, I, I have to say, like I, I have not watched a lot of IPL. I'd love to watch maybe a few minis of it or stuff like that because evidently, yeah. everybody who's been there or knows anything about it says the skills are unbelievable. Yeah, the players there are incredible, but it's yeah. very difficult to attach to the narrative of mm. it to get behind a team or whatnot because of the times and our inherent bias towards Australia. Are they saying that because of the? You know what I mean? hey? You're making a gesture that most people won't be able yeah, to see. I forgot this was an audio product. <laughs> <laughs> We're a YouTube show now. <laughs> um, yeah, but you're right, Bio, because like my interest with the IPL is like, you know, how many runs did Warner score or yeah. whatever? Who did well? Did Maxwell hit a reverse sweep mm. six for a highlight yeah. for a YouTube, yeah. for, a, for an Instagram clip that yeah. I can like, like a double yeah. tap while scrolling? I'm just watching TV. Like, I just want to see dimly lit Warner hit three shots at, yeah. on his way to 112 not out and go, that's good. Mm. All is well in Australian cricket. Yeah. I want to see Besto hit 80 off 20 balls. Mm. That's what I want. That actually did happen once. He got like a uh, 24 mm. ball 80 or something like or that. Or to see like Davilius and Coley are at the crease together. Oh, that's fun. Then next. It's yeah, like literally the two best players. Yeah. I was, I'm a big I'm a fan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Our standards are high. We won a lot. Mm. But when the Sixers oh, yeah. are playing against the Strikers. Right. And when, Sean Abbott, when Sean Abbott's steaming in there, <laughs> bowling at the death to John O'Wells, <laughs> hell yeah. But this isn't part of our <laughs> this isn't part of our get into India play. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but don't you reckon like the like the true like it, like, is is there a future? Is there a league that can exist in T Twenty cricket that is like truly global? Is the IPL global? I think it's still a really heavily Indian product. And whilst you mean India, global, like the way the EPL is, or something, right? Or the NBA, even. Yeah. Whereas I think, like, if India control the biggest league, and they do, why the fuck would India care? Like, what market share they have in Australia or the UK or South Africa? There's not enough people here. There's, mm. there's not enough people to run a fucking. Well, yeah, all the countries combined still do not even match the, the market over in so India. So what's the point? Yeah. yeah, as long as they're controlling it, like, do they have any interest in expanding it outside to show it to, like, getting those games, to having, like, day games, like starting games at, like, midday, for instance, the way the Premier League does to capture the... Um, Asian audience. The Asian audience, thank yeah. you, yeah. Do they have any interest in that? Oh, yeah, I, don't, I haven't Probably spoken not. to, yeah. You know, you, I mean, you, yeah. you're not... And Srinivasan. I haven't, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't spoken to Dada. Yeah, <laughs> no, I haven't spoken... I'd love to speak to Dada. That's a big one for this summer. <laughs> Mate, someone says someone there's says, no way that you're getting data on the show. Jeez. And by that, I mean my dad. <laughs> Keep saying that when I walk into the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had somebody who was uh, showing us that they wanted to carpet bomb Johnny Bairstow's DMs with requests to go on The Great Cricketer. And we just, like, said thank you, um, but oh, politely yeah. asked him, requested he not do that. Because uh, there is a play, you know, there is a play afoot 
for JB. We're still working on it. Sometimes these partnerships are long-term affairs, you know, and now the same with Saurav Ganguly. If we get Ganguly before mm. Shane Watson, there's something wrong with the system. Anyway, stick around because Dada's on the show. <clears throat> Pez, before we head into a couple of great chats, and I will conclude Zach Crawley, which we have not done yet, but yeah. it's going to be a good chat because yeah. of what we discussed earlier. I want to talk about um, the Black Lives Matter th- um, movement in Australia specifically and the relationship that Australia has with it because there was a thing that was going around where Aust- so Australia announced before the T20 series, they played six games in, in, in England, but before that T20 series started in the UK, Aaron Finch said that, that, that Australia weren't going to take a knee And they said that the reason they were going to do that, the reason they weren't going to do that is because whilst protesting is important, education is ultimately the thing they're going to do it. Since then, Michael Holding came out and he said, just fucking do it. Like, you don't realise the power that professional athletes have and the message they can send. Described it as lame. Yes. Justin Langer said, we didn't understand, we apologised. And then Jason Gillespie has since come out and he said they're very surprised they didn't do it. My problem with it, mate, is that to sort of hijack this conversation that I've introduced myself – is that I think Australia have like a history of like not addressing any sort of racial vilification um, that is happening within the country and, you know, cricket being the national sport in Australia has a great opportunity to be a leader in actually making a statement, but Mm. are they going to do it? So, for instance, like um, Justin Langer apologised for not doing it. There were still like three games left in the series that they they could have had the opportunity or two games left before they – but when he was saying, like, oh, we apologise, didn't realise the impact of it and stuff, but still didn't do it after that. You can guarantee that, like, remember the beginning of the English summer, Sky Sports run that great thing with um, Ebony and Michael Holding about the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff like that, and uh, you can guarantee that like, by the time that the summer starts, no network here is going to do a similar thing. Are they going to take a knee um, during the during the test match series against India out here? Are they fucked? They're not going to do that. Mm. Do you remember a couple of years ago, um, it was like two years ago, there was a couple of guys went into um, Optus Stadium there in Perth mm. and held up a banner during a Big Bash game, said it's okay to be white. Mm. Cricket Australia's response to that was no life bans, no fines. They got a warning. Mm. That, that, so they're allowed to come back into the ground again anytime they want. I mean, it's, it, there's, like a, there's a pattern here that is not being addressed at all. And that, once again, a simple thing of like just taking a knee, maybe scared because some fucking white cunt in Australia on Twitter is going to be like, fucks this shit. Well, well, not, not just one. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So, Which isn't to defend it. It's more just a realistic uh, that's, that's, appraisal of how that's many what, That's what will happen. There yeah, are. Exactly, yeah. Um, well, yeah, you're right. Like, and, and you're right to raise it too. You know, I think some people might be listening thinking, oh, you guys banging on about this again. Get off the work train. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're on the work train, are you? But also, you know, it's, it's one thing to join into the news cycle when everybody's talking about it, as we did a few weeks ago with what has had gone on in Yorkshire. Right. But too often you see people jump on the news cycle, get their clicks, um, be part of the noise around it, and then just watch as it washes away mm. and we just forget right. what goes on. So we will keep jumping on it uh, for sure. And I, and I think it was it's good that that question was asked to Langer. And I think that Holding's comments were – were bang on. I don't think it was necessarily a criticism of Aaron Finch, uh, who's dealing with no. complexities uh, that that run, you know, beyond even the remit of the Australian captain. Mm-hmm. He's probably fed a line, and he said it almost. Definitely. But ho- holding is right because education and symbolism is not an either or conversation. Right, both is possible. Why? It's not as though if you do one, then you're absolved uh, from the other. Do both if you're serious. But the, the good thing is, and I was like, I was encouraged by what Langer said. I believe. Uh, him, I think he's being authentic when he says uh, we could have given more to that. The great thing for Langer is that the good news is that there are further opportunities. More opportunities, yeah. To match that education um, with symbolism or whatever it is they try to do. Now, I noticed that Cricket Australia have set up a Connecting Country series. Dan Christian's been saying stuff that a lot of people have been telling stories about, uh, you know, that, that are aimed towards highlighting a lot of injustices that have gone on in cricket in relation to Indigenous Australians. Um, so that's great. Really mm-hmm. welcome that. Mm-hmm. It's st- As we've said before, it'll be really interesting to see what they do uh, this summer. Who knows whether it's education and symbolism. Who, who knows what they want to do. Who, who, let's see what the networks do as well. But um, it's not something that just uh, you can pick up when there's an allegation or a story of racism, get on your, um, get on your soapbox about it, then forget about it. You've got to keep up the energy. You've got to maintain the rage. Guys like Dan Christian are doing that, which is mm-hmm. fantastic. Look forward to seeing mm-hmm. what Cricket Australia does plan this summer to highlight what they're going to do, as well as the networks. Mm. Pez, well said. Zach Crawley's coming up, Pez. And then after that, Shane Lee.
How's this for prodigal? Let's let's just do the big stuff straight up. Eight Please. tests. After eight tests, average of 48.41. Let's just round that up, 50. Not bad. Average is 50 after eight tests. Uh, and a high score of 267. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, equally important is the, this guy played a season of Sydney grade cricket. Yeah. Uh, Smashed him as well. Yeah. So a good player. 760 runs at 65. Yeah. Um, we've been about as forensic as it gets, as it gets uh, when it comes to investigating his time uh, in grade cricket, uh, and we look forward to learning about it uh, with him on the line. I'm talking about Zach Crawley. Uh, Zach, welcome to the Grade Cricketer Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Zach, I, I want to start with a quote from a teammate of yours at Sydney Tigers. Um, so we sort of went sniffing around uh, about you. And he said, okay. uh, it was where you played. Uh, and he said, unfortunately, Zach was one of the few poms that came to Australia to improve his cricket and not drink for six months. So there's not too much on him. Mm. So you're probably feeling pretty good about that. Um, we did manage to learn a little bit about you. But before we lift the lid, uh, how, how was your experience of Sydney grade cricket, which we call Sydney test cricket, um, with great insecurity? <laughs> Um, and uh, to what extent was Sydney Grey Cricket the reason for your uh, for the excellent start to your test career? Yeah, I reckon it's probably 80, 90 percent. I mean, it was um, <laughs> you know it's proper cricket. You know, they uh, you know as good as our first class over here as they like to think anyway. And um, you know, you certainly get shirts uh, way more than you're going to get shirts in test cricket. So I mean, I could it's, it's about as good a preparation I could ask for, really. It's, it's funny you say that. We, we talked to uh, Sam Billings a couple of weeks ago. We called Bilbo. Him, call, call him Bilbo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't invite us to call him. Bilbo. No, didn't we know. did anyway. No. Um, he made a similar comment I picked up where he's like, yeah, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people there like to think that the, the level's quite high. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we stopped playing a long time ago and we still talk about it as well. Like, like what, is the, what is the chat among, uh, you know, the worldy English cricketers who do spend some time playing grade cricket? I mean, because you're clearly better than all the players who play grade cricket. Mm. You know, what, what's your observation of, like, the insecurity of Sydney grade cricketers? <laughs> no, it's not that. I think they just back themselves. I think they're like most Aussies, really, which is class. That's one of the good things about you, boys, <laughs> is that you back yourself in any situation, really, and I think that's the same with uh, Aussie grade cricketers. I mean, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll ask you, um, you know, did you have the club on an overseas next year? And you're thinking they're talking about my club, like, as in my like, local village club. And um, they'll be like, no, no, it's all Matt Ken. And we're like, well, we kind of got, you know, Matt Henry coming from New Zealand to play for us. You know, I'm not sure you're going to get in. <laughs> but, um, the, you know, it's, um, they're good lads, though. I mean, I enjoy the way they go about their cricket. They, uh, they back themselves, that's for sure. Mm. I think Matt Henry bowls second change uh, yeah. of England yeah. cricket. So Twos. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like twos, yeah. It's like, I want to I get into, it's like, so probably worldy territory here because, like, in terms of Sam said in the intro there, Pezzy Lad said in the intro there, just, um, you know, proper, like, you know, just knew you were going to make it from an early age. But I want to know, like, at what age did you know you were going to make it? Because you, I think, am I right in saying you got your first Kent's contract at 17, obviously playing test cricket at 22, you got your first double hundred at the age of 22 um, much much earlier than I ever did um, but I mean like at what, at what age, uh, I'm still waiting for mine actually yeah. <laughs> just still waiting for my chance just trying to get through third grade yeah. um, but like uh, you know at what age did you think um, I reckon I can probably make it make a run of it uh, professional cricket here were you like 8, 9 like yeah. what, what age were you 4 yeah 4 oh yeah was 4 <laughs> no probably around when I was like 13, 14 I started taking it quite seriously with you know with the goal that it was, I had a good chance mm. um but you know, never. I didn't feel like, even when I got my first contract. I thought I didn't. I wasn't expecting. That. I thought I was going to have another year um, playing twos cricket and things like that. But um, mm. so everything kind of came. It always comes a bit earlier than you expect it. But you know, it was my goal mm. from the age of thirteen, fourteen to to give it a good crack. And I knew that if I did, you know, throw my eggs and what, all in that basket, that I had a good chance. So mm. yeah, it was probably around that age. But uh, mm. you know, I never knew until, until it happened, really. Because I did the same thing at the same age, and now I do a podcast uh, with my friend. <laughs> so, you know, different, different crew treasures. Now, I want to ask you about, because um, after you got your 267, obviously, against Pakistan just recently, Rob Key was um, on Sky with NASA. And I'll say NASA like he's my friend. Mm. Um, never met him. And <laughs> never, never met him. And there, were, there was heaps of footage there of you like getting, like just netting from the age of, yeah, about 13, 14, all going through like the, the Kent uh, Academy system and stuff. I mean, just like getting balls endlessly thrown at you. I mean, how many balls would you hit in a session now? Because I reckon like a guy like Steve Smith, for instance, might get, you know, two million. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It depends on how well you're in, in the game. But I mean, mm. I don't know, maybe 500, something like that. Maybe, yeah, something like that virus. I reckon yeah. something like that. Mm. I mean, it's tough to say. We were trying to work out the other day in Sandrum how many balls Joe Root hit in his career. Mm. And I reckon it must be around a million. Oh um, so we were talking about if we took down all these games and practice. So, I mean, yeah, if you had all those up, I mean, he loved hitting balls, Joe, to be fair. And that's probably why he's the best. 
Because when you're hitting that many balls now, like you, you might do the thing like all great cricketers do, Zach, in terms of if you just slightly miss time one, you might yell out in anguish being, you know, might might little four letter word hanging out. Just let people know that you usually middle those. But yeah. you must if you hit five hundred balls in a session, right, and you middle four hundred and eighty, are you yelling out that you missed time to twenty? Yeah. Just let people know. Let people know. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you gotta make sure you let everyone know that you know, that you're smoking them. And then so <laughs> you know, and then Yeah. Just they so they know where they are when you, where, where you're hitting them and that and and also when you get out you'll make sure that you, you know you have a big laugh in the change room so they know you care quite a bit yeah. <laughs> um, you know yeah. and you miss out on a double hundred there when you get out to ten yeah. this guy hasn't got anger management problems he just cares he just cares yeah, he just cares. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. no yeah he just cares more than everyone well let's stick with Greg cricket um, Zach uh, probably for eighty percent of this show which is quite disrespectful but anyway um, you're you're the owner. You're the owner of the fastest 100 in Sydney Premier Cricket history, I read, um, including all levels. So, so that's a competition of Trumper, Bradman, Miller, The Wars, Richard Cheekwee, Ian Moran and Ian Higgins. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so on this day against Sutherland, who we hit this ton, who had Steve Smith playing, um, he was on a band, yeah. some might remember, um, yeah. you made 100 off 42 balls and according to a few of your teammates, you slog swept Ben Dwarshus into the tree there many, many times. Um, what, do, what, what do you remember about that fixture? Um, I remember uh, coming in and um, hitting Smith over his head and I said, keep it there, much and, um, you know, stuff like that. And then, um... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, it was one of those freak days, first where I just um, everything I tried came off, and it was a real short boundary. And um, Dorsey was getting so annoyed with me because, like you said, I was I was trying to hit these sweeps, and they were, I was like splicing them for six. Um, but uh, no, it was, uh, it was, it was a good day. I, I ended up dropping the game though later on. That's my residing memory of that game. I dropped Dorsey later that game on there. They needed like twenty off nine balls, uh, and he that's a shame. smoked this one in the air. Yeah, but you know, like you know, I'll, t- I'll take the hundred and the loss. So. Well, thank you. Well yeah, done. Yeah. You. That's good yeah. bingo. Tick that off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was hoping you would mention that you lost. Just like the jokes. I was going yeah. yeah, to. I was going to follow up with that because yeah, you, you dropped one Sutherland chase two hundred and one. Um, so just against the, just, just a few other contra- controversies during your time here. Um, lots of the guys we spoke to, <laughs> they said Zach is a fantastic young man, probably future England captain. He barely circuited. In fact, one said I think he would succeed in a biosecure bubble because he's not big on the circuit. Um, so, so the reputation is of an upstanding, well-behaved gentleman who dominated Sydney Pretenders. Um, and yet, I've come across a controversy in, involving a catch on the road. Oh, here we go. Um, I've, I've, been, oh, wow. I've been given a picture, um, which we'll put up on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I've seen the picture. Uh, the mm-hmm. person in the picture appears to be you, Zach. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're holding the ball, your foot's on the rope, yeah. the ball's in hand. The guy you dismissed was on 100 plus. I'm told he missed a state contract because of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, how, changed his life. how changed good his did life. it feel like to just discard decency and morals and just claim it? Very Australian. And did you correctly and immediately let your teammates know when yeah. in the huddle that yeah. you were claiming it yeah. despite your foot being on the road? Like how good did yes. that feel? Yes. A hundred percent. I mean, especially because he was on a hundred and I thought there's no chance of letting him bat on after tea because it was a full before tea and I thought no chance. I thought, and um, I knew the camera was on me, and I thought I'd step on the rope and just to make, just to make, just make Do you see? I see what you're doing there because yeah. I know you've spoken public about this. Yeah, I didn't know my foot was on the rope, and yeah. other teammates have come in to Whoops, defend you yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. You're not, you're a nice mm-hmm. person, mm-hmm. but we all know deep down, like you would have, fe- you would have, you would have felt that rope on your foot as yeah, you, you took the ball. It. You felt it. You <laughs> felt Oh dear! To be honest, if you look at that photo again, you'll see a bird yeah. right below yeah. my a, foot. an actual flying bird, which yeah, is actually, not yeah. a woman. No, which is a remarkable coincidence, and I'm I'm calling foul play on that. Someone's photoshopped that and like put that bird in there because my foot's never been on the road. That's <laughs> right, foul play. I like it. It's a deep fake. Absolutely, yeah, it's a deep fake. Well, I'm looking forward oh, to that. T- yeah. fake. I'm looking forward to that turning up uh, during the Ashes if there's a contro- controversy there. We'll talk about the Ashes in a sec. Um, I just, just one more thing, just from from grade cricket. Um, I was just meant to ask, century at Manly Oval. I was meant to ask you about abuse you copped from a Manly bowler while you were on 120 at the time and continuing to launch him into the tennis court. So that ring a bell, or is that just was that just most Saturdays? That was actually the other um, county cricketer, uh, Steve Eskenazi. I was kind of in the middle of it, but it was mainly between those two. Right. Um, but uh, actually, he was the one mainly copping it out. Uh, they both had a few choice words, and I thought I'd chime in with the odd one. But um, I, I was kind of the, the third wheeler in that in that um, 
in that one. But you know, I definitely caught my fair share on the Saturdays, that's for sure. So I actually haven't clocked until now, and now I realise you're failing to name who that bowler was. But as I think about it and put it together, just just cough if it was Steve O'Keefe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> I genuinely hadn't thought about that till yeah. now. Great friend of the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's here on the line right yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, uh, I want to ask you, Zach, because obviously there's a couple of guys in the England setup at the moment. I'm thinking Ollie Pope and uh, your Kent uh, teammate, Joe Denley, have also played in Sydney great cricket. And do you guys ever talk about great cricket and in, in, just even in, in the sense of like, what the fuck was that about? Or is it just like, those guys? yeah, what's wrong with those blokes? Or is it kind yeah. of a thing of like, oh, no, that was actually quite good fun and, you know, kind of, um, you know, excelled my cricket in some capacity. Please lie. No, it's definitely, it's a bit of both. I mean, we have a laugh about, um, like what we said earlier, about um, the Aussies asking to come over and play county cricket. And, you sure. know, they don't rate county cricket. We have a laugh about that. Yeah. But in, in all seriousness, we, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a massive um, benefit. I and mean, we always tell like, young lads coming through as well, you, know, you got to get yourself out there and do it. Because, you know, it's just that competitive, cricket you get you know instead of being sat at home in the freezing cold over here you mm. go out and play over there and mm. it's, it's quality for your cricket it's no surprise people who go across come back and have good years mm. um, so now we, we do have a laugh at, uh, a laugh at joke about it but in all terms it's, it's, it's top draw because when you say they're like you, you tell young the, young, the young lads, you're yeah. 22. So that yeah. actually leads into my next question because at the beginning of the summer, obviously Stuart Broad was dropped um, from the England setup. And I want to know what you said to Stuart. Did you get your arm around him? Is it a Dario young lad? Like, you know, you come back from this. Did you sort of get an arm around him? Like, what, yeah. what, 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 what did you say when Stuart, when he was actually I actually think involved? we just need to try a bit of pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going for with Nacho and, you know, we're going for the Gabba in 2021. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can't believe he got dropped. He castled me about 10 times before the game, <laughs> the day before. And I thought, I was like, this is surely, well, this is remarkable. And then, um, and then he didn't get picked. I was like, well, geez, I'm going to show you what kind of neck I'm in if he didn't get picked. <laughs> um, I was out about 15 times, but, um, but yeah, no, he's, uh, no, there was no, no, no words to do. He, he's, um, he's got enough experience. <laughs> yeah. I saw, you know, the, the, the question that's lingering out there when you say, you know, oh, look, I should invite the other, you know, I should invite the young guys to go along mm. is that like you've probably graduated from Sydney grade cricket graduated. now and, and that's probably what 267 test runs does probably. for a person. Yeah. I, I probably don't need to go back to live in a, an apartment in Dremoyne <laughs> <laughs> and go to PJ's. <laughs> But um, what I mean, tell, tell us, Zach, like what you know. There, there was, I mean, it's more than a breakthrough innings. It was a, it was a record breaking innings. Like, what, what, what does that do for the mentality, you know, of a, of a twenty two year old? You know, like where, where does that leave you? Um, are you putting any kind of caveats on it? Oh, I was mm. in the bubble. It's a weird time. No one was there. Or, or, or are you really taking it on as like you know a, a major, major achievement? I am Jesus now. I am Jesus. And <laughs> uh, but, but do, do you do you feel like it elevates your status as a? Test cricketer, albeit a very new one. Yeah, no doubt. I think you know it's definitely given me a lot more confidence. I mean, it's up to other people to see how much, uh, or say how much it's um, put me on the, you know, risen me as a test, test cricketer, so to speak. But um, you know, it's definitely given me a lot more confidence. You know, you, I was kind of my first class record wasn't great uh, being picked for England, uh, and you know, so you kind of stand there thinking, what do these boys think? I'm absolutely useless. Um, so it's quite nice to, to score a couple of runs and then uh, you know show some people that you, that you can play a little bit. But um, but no, I suppose I've done people and hopefully you know I can build it from here. You know I don't want to, I don't want to be a, a one-off. Hopefully I can get a few more. Mm. I mentioned mentioned earlier there. Obviously your mentor was Rob Key, who's spoken glowingly about your performance, especially like just just harping on the, the two sixty-seven, and we'll be harping on as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, just sort of banging on about that. But um, I, I saw um during that innings when you went past Rob Key's two twenty-one, which is Rob Key's um, only test hundred test hundred, but also his highest score in the test game. And then when you went past there. When you went past Rob Key's score, the big smile on your face, great achievement for you personally. And then through the stump mics, the Pakistani were playing, players were saying, who's Roby Key? <laughs> <laughs> so does that diminish the innings in any way? <laughs> oh, I suppose so, a little bit. It was a remarkable <laughs> moment, actually, because I was like, I knew what was going on, obviously. I was like, the bang, get two, 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 big smile on my face. But everyone actually, there was a big roar around the crowd. There was like 10 people in there, mm. but all the lads in the changing room started to call out. All the Pakistanis started clapping, and it was quite a big moment, really. So it was, uh, it was, it was funny. I could actually see him up in the comedy box. He was shaking his head. He couldn't, he, he didn't know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> You were saying earlier there, because um, I think a fair comparison would be with um, same in Australia as Manus Labuskakni, who had a, a relatively similar 
um, first class record in terms of averaging sort of mid thirties, uh, and then coming to the test setup and has obviously really excelled, uh, excelled amazingly so very quickly as well. And then you've done the same thing, and also then you've, now you've gone back to playing for Kent and you scored a hundred and eight off fifty four balls in the Vitality Bias. Got a hundred as well against Hampshire at the Rose Bowls at uh, the AGS Bowl rather. I mean, like, have you just figured out that county cricket? Oh, I'm just way better than this now. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. definitely not. You never take for granted. Of course yeah. not. Just but say the, yes. Um, say yes. It, just say yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A <laughs> uh, couple of people hanging out for this question, Zach, uh, based on comments you know that were made on this podcast a few weeks ago. But j- just give me a little bit of space here. So you're, you're actually the tallest batsman to make a double hundred for England. Obviously, people think he's shouting into their microphones. Oh, Tony Gregg was six foot six, but his high score is 148. Sure. Um, yep. he, here in Australia, Zach, as you know, like we get very specific about not just scoring runs, we're scoring the right type of runs. You know, like someone may objectively score lots of runs, but if they don't adhere to our very narrow aesthetic requirements, we'll treat them with suspicion until the distrusted into oblivion, right? right? So let me give you a theory. Right. For example, uh, we like our batsmen short and diminutive, you know, low centre of gravity, balanced, compact, you know, think Bradman, Boone, Ponting, overseas, Tendilka, Lara, etc. You yeah. see where it's going. Um, so we'll inherently accept these batsmen because they look the way we think batsmen should look, right? I'm halfway through. Um, so, so if they're t- in Australia, right, this is a theory, if they're tall, then they need to match that height with Hulk. So they... <laughs> <laughs> they need to be thick, you know, Hayden, Peterson. So, thick, yeah, like, yes. are you prepared for the fact that when you come to Australia for the Ashes next year, and let's for the sake of argument presume you will, um, no amount of runs you score will earn the respect of Australians unless you become thick. Um, and with that in mind, do you have sympathy for the thesis that some may believe tall runs will always be weird runs? Yeah, well, 100%. And, you know, I'm trying my best. You know, lucky, luckily we had Stoinis over here last year. That's 2020, and he was... You know, he was taking me to the gym, and we were doing some some good chest work. But oh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to stick it out, and you know, try and be respected by the Aussies over there for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, just 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 on that, Zach, because um, obviously you have uh, England's supposed to have Sri Lanka in January, I think it is, and then then you're supposed to go to the Indian tour. All things being well. But would it be fair to say that uh, that the Ashes is on the mind? For, I'm talking about you personally as well. Like, you know, the Ashes is what to uh, be 12, 14 months away now, Pez. That'd be about right. I mean, is 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 that the goal right now? Well, I mean, you know, like like you said, there's a lot of tests in there. But obviously, sure. I'd be lying if I was in the back of my mind. Like, um, it'd be you know, if I, if I have a good year, I might be on that tour. I mean, that'd be what every cricketer wants from England, or Australia. So, yeah. you know, I'd be lying if I was if I didn't say it's back of my mind. But um, you know, like I say, you've got some tough tours coming up in, in in away in India. So, um, mm. well, and Sri Lanka, obviously. So, um, I hope I can do all right in those first and get myself on that tour. Mm. Yeah, but you'll 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 be here. I mean, you know, what a two six. You can dine out on two sixty seven for about two years. I've always I think, said that. Sure. We've yeah. always said that's about yeah. two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and because you'll face some scrutiny when you come out, Zach. It's kind of more of a warm up, you know. So like, I know you're a big listener of the show. Um, <laughs> you know, like like we, we are a show that covers the dark world of amateur cricket, which naturally means we spend fifty percent of the show discussing dad stuff. You know, like did dad come to the game? Yeah. Did he take an interest in growing like growing up? Did he remain silent driving you home from when you threw it away again? You know, yeah. Um, yeah. like it's no different at the pro level. Like a couple of weeks back, Sam Billings basically confirmed his dad flew a helicopter over a game as James Faulkner was abusing him. Um, <laughs> it's half true. We're probably playing. Um, so in the same vein, like I've just done a bit of digging to prepare for the Ashes, found a snippet of a piece from June 97 about your dad, um, which, which reads, a carpet fitter who ditched his Stanley knife to carve a career in the city is now pocketing more than £8 million a year. Terry Crawley, who started life on a rough council estate, is making a pile dealing in high-risk financial markets. And the 34-year-old whiz kid has become Britain's fifth paid highest man behind rock idols Elton John, Sting, Eric Clapton and Phil Collins. Um, blah, 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 blah. He earned £100 a week fitting carpets but now he owns a 2.25 million pound um estate in kent village that was june 6 1997 don't need to name where that came from um uh shane warren now this is, this is a question shane warren has a huge rap on you and has been talking you up you know on comms a fair bit he also plays a fair <laughs> bit of golf with your dad terry i understand we've been doing some digging um I, I guess what i'm asking is like do the billingses or the crawleys have a higher net worth um and do you think warney's trying to claim a slice of the crawley family estate <laughs> <laughs> Just getting you ready. No comment. I'm in the fifth on that one. <laughs> Is Shane there? Can we speak? Oh my god. Yeah. Is that be much? 
It's still if it's too far. <laughs> it's just a bit. Um, <laughs> so, Zach, yeah, I know I said <laughs> we'll chat for 10 minutes, but uh, we we ve- we, that, that, that's all. We very much appreciate your time. Thank you for being so generous uh, with your answers and enduring all of that. And, uh, you know, b- because of your association with Rob Key and the runs that you've scored and the fact that you've played in Sydney and you seem to be nice about it all, um, you know, you'll be one of our favourites. We're looking forward to you coming out to the Ashes um, and seeing how that all goes. And, you know, if you need advice around um, dealing with the, the tall ones, tall runs, weird runs thing, like, please come and talk to us. But otherwise, go well. Oh, I appreciate that too, boys. Thanks. <laughs> he goes, uh, for listeners of a certain vintage, hearts will be a flutter mm-hmm. for this guest. Um, you know, <laughs> oh, to be a talented blonde haired all rounder in Australia in the mid to late 90s. What I wouldn't give. Playing 50 odd ODIs for your country, scoring 5,000 first class runs, 150 wickets for the Alpha State, New South Wales. Watching your younger brother frighten your peers, then touring alongside him in a rock and roll band with Brad McNamara, Gav Robertson, and Richard Cheekwee, where God only knows what occurred after those shows. <laughs> Shane Lee, welcome to the Great Cricketer. Jeez, it's hard to be humble after that introduction, boys. Don't, Don't be humble. Don't Very be well. Don't be humble. That's how this works. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's good to be here, guys. Like, like the, the smell of spring is in the air, um, which always excited me this time of year. It means pre-season's almost over and cricket season's about to start, so looking forward to it. That's interesting. That sounds like you like cricket. Well, let, let's start with grade cricket, Shane. You know, you played most of your grade cricket on what's actually officially now known as the best era, um, the 90s. You debuted for New South Wales at age 20, so you were basically – the quintessential New South Wales state player during this time. Can you paint a picture of grade cricket for us during this time, like, you know, where men were really men? Um, what was your relationship to it? Well, I, th- I think I've said before, it's the great cricket you played on a parched outfield with a parched throat and every second bloke called you a prick. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty much great cricket. It was, uh, that, it, it, it was tough. It was always competitive. Um, a lot of the you – know, all the New South Wales players used to play when they are available – for your own grade club um, and some Australian players as well. Um, these days, I don't think um, anyone who gets paid a cent goes near grade cricket, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, Shane, you um, you played in an amazingly strong team in Mossman in the in the Sydney Test competition. Mm. Um, yep. And some of the some of the names in that team in that time, maybe not in the same fixture, were like obviously yourself, Brett. Uh, and then Shaw Bakhtar, Niall O'Brien, Waka Yunus. I mean, did you guys ever play in the same team? And then who else is even getting a game in that team? Is it just like some nervous 24-year-old bloke who's just trying to keep his spot maybe in the first and second grade squad who's just getting his bat signed? Yeah, there, there was a bloke called um, uh, Matt Bradshaw who uh, he still, he's still dying on the fact that we still hold the Mossman, I think it's the fifth uh, we get partnership, something of 200 and something, mm. and he got he got 12 of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> MB, I had my, best, my best 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 day out playing against Gordon. I got two hundred and ten not out, but um, as he said, he's still in the book with me. No, it, it was it was a bloody good team. I remember when um, Show Bacta first came to the club, and I went up to Alan Border Oval to, to to meet him for the first time. I welcomed him to the club, and and um, I said, "Mate, can I buy you a beer?" He said, "No, no, it's on me. It's on me." I said, "No, let me get you a beer." I said, "No, it's on me, mate. You've, you've come to our club. I'll get you a beer." He said, "No, it's on me." I was sort of fair enough, and he had some little Pakistani mates says, go get Shane a beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, a, what a guy. That's how we rolled, yeah. <laughs> in, in there, like, I mean, God, there were so many characters who played in that era, Shane. Like, where does Shawab rank in terms of the alpha life, you know? Like, when he mm. turned up, was it kind of – was there more gawking over him than anyone else? I mean, like, who, who were the biggest characters uh, on that scene? He, he was definitely a character. Um Steve Waugh used to always say, whenever we played Pakistan, they were, they, they were sort of five minutes away from a coup. Um, <laughs> they, with, 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 within about three or four overs, they could either take five quick wickets or there could be a new captain. So um, you, had to be, yeah, you had to be really consistent and tough with him. But you know, he was called the Royal Pindi Express and he would fly in. And, um, and yeah, and, and we, our, our wicket keeper at the time was a guy called Cameron Guthrie, who I think has kept his to the two fastest bowlers ever in, in the one game. He kept to both Brett and Shoab and, um, and Shoab steamed in against St. George one day and he took about five wickets and, and they were shooting themselves, to be honest. And, and so, so were both of us. And the <laughs> yeah, I bet. So Shoab Akhtar is just pushing off from the sight screen in a grade game. you got Brett Lee at the other end. Wacko Yunus probably buying first change, just, mm-hmm. hoping, just trying to scratch the ball up for a bit mm-hmm. of reverse swing, allegedly. Uh, I mean, like, uh, like, how, like, how quick is Shoab? Is he going full tilt in, in a grade game? Yeah, he was going full to it, but only for about four overs. Um, sure, yeah. 
where we're grabbed by a cricket. Actually, the, the third bowler in that game was a guy called Phil Alley. Yeah. You remember, um, yeah. we, used to, we used to call Phil the crayfish because he was six foot ten. He was all body and a head full of shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There's, There's the something. 90s. <laughs> I was hopping a time machine there, Pez. <laughs> I can I can yeah. feel the grin coming over your face as you said <laughs> head full of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it was exceptional bowl as well. He was up the field, so um, but yeah, but not 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 the, not the sharp field the shed. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a little punch at the yeah, end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, 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 this is really um, a pedestrian question, Shane. But even in that, is it was it one game that Brett and Shell played together, or maybe a couple? I mean, it, can you do a pace comparison there? It is your younger brother, so you've probably got the best position from which to either like destroy him or back him here. But you know, Shell v Brett in the same game, who's um, scaring the bat the batsman more? Oh, uh, Brett, Brett was slightly quicker, um, and I was the captain, so I gave Brett, Brett the downwind. <laughs> <laughs> Show him up the slope, put a shift in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he bought me one beer, so. He got, he got that <laughs> but no, he, 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 Brett, Brett was definitely quicker. But um, but Show would often um, like through the air, like the the, the Yorker, it, it felt quicker. But Brett would hit the bat a lot harder, and yeah, you know, Brett, Brett bowled 150 kilometres for only 20 years. Mm. Um, and uh, Show probably did it off and on for fifteen minutes or something, but but he was like he, he was he was a great pilot as well. And uh, but he's a really really good club man. He enjoyed the enjoyed the circuit going out afterwards, mm-hmm. and um, you know he liked the ladies as well. I bet he did. I mean, just yeah. to, to hit the um, I mean, don't, don't hit the old cliches here, like a couple of the Lee brothers in the backyard, you yeah. know, getting down there having a hit and having a bowl. But you must have been like when when Brett was coming through. You must have been like, "Fuck that! I'm going to bowl today. I'm definitely bowling today in the backyard." Like, I mean, you had to you had a career of just facing Brett Lee in the backyard. That must have been a whole career of no thank you. Well, it wasn't too bad. I think I scored. I got I got a four hundred one day, and I got him out. I got him out second ball, and um, I went outside for a drink, and Brett was crying. Mum made me go out and bowl him again. I, I knocked him out for twelve in the second dig. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Shane could play too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Shane was a pretty good player. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and our poor younger brother Grant, he was he was the youngest, so he was building the whole time. So yeah. that's why he retired. He retired at eighteen. Had a gut ball. <laughs> Saw that on Wiki. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Grant retired at eighteen. That makes complete sense. Uh, you, you debuted for New South Wales at age twenty, Shane. Uh, back then, like it felt like every single New South Welshman either played for Australia or would go on to play for Australia. Like, and rightfully like, so. And rightfully so. Like, just how superior did you feel as a blue bagger at the time? Yeah, it was funny. There was a real culture when we came in um, where there was instant belief. There's something like you put the blue cap on, you, you had these magical powers. Um, and for the first few seasons I played, well, I won the double twice in a row. So, you know, the Sheffield Shield and the Mercantile Mutual Cup. Um, so that, that, that was an amazing time. You, you, you then work out that, uh, unfortunately, we had so many players playing in the Australian team that when they all exited, um, we were left with some really... Uh, some pretty ordinary cricketers, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Name them. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Alley. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and Phil, Phil Alley wasn't too bad. I just said he went off the field. But, uh, yeah, we had some guys that would have played um, over those periods. And it was quite funny. Um, during that period, we had a, a selected John Benno, which was, which was Richie Benno's um, younger, younger brother, who also played for Australia. And I remember we went to Perth where we used to get smashed, completely smashed over there. And at the time, we had some very interesting selections. Um, and there's a lot of mumbling that's going on within the team. And, and so he pulls us aside and he said, guys, okay, um, everyone write down your best 12 New South Wales without the Australian players and we'll discuss them. And everyone wrote them down. We, we, he sort of read them out and everyone said, you've got to be kidding, mate. You wouldn't pick him, wouldn't pick him. You've got to be backing. And he goes, it's not so fucking easy, is it, boy? <laughs> Just a hint of Richie in that accent as well. I like yeah, that. That's yeah. right. And um, and that game, Corey Richards, uh, we, well, I think we got beaten about three days over there, so we had a massive night out. And so Corey Richards was struggling the next morning, and I was rooming with him. So I made sure I did the right thing, got him to the bus on time. But as he was getting on the bus, John Benno was waiting there with the clipboards, you know, kicking all our names off, and, and Corey vomited on John Benno's shoes, the selector's shoes. And he told me to get the fuck get the fuck off the bus, mate. You go to the airport. Um, the next game's in Melbourne. If you don't get a hundred, you'll never play for New South Wales again. <laughs> oh my god! And and the, and the record shows Corey scored six first first class hundreds in a row after that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm he should have been vomiting on the selection boots <laughs> for many years before. Yeah, should have. So done. Yeah, he got 
Yeah. That, that's, um, that, that era, Shane, is like, it, it is an amazing era that you were right in the midst of as well. Obviously, you had like two couple of World Cup runs in 96 and 99. I was just going through some, I just, you know, one of my regular things is to YouTube Shane Lee highlights. Of course. And one of the, one of the great things is that, as I'm sure you're doing <laughs> as well, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> and like one of the things on there is that, um, the Australian team are playing against the Cricket Academy in 1997. And, oh, yeah. and that, the Cricket Academy side has obviously Brett Lee's playing in it, Gilchrist. Uh, Andrew Simons, Ricky Ponting, mm. I think Stuart Law is playing in it. Um, yeah. Like the, like who has a cricket academy and they're like, well, we're going to put them against the current Australian side. And mm. the, I don't, like, was that game a tie? Is that right? I, I can't remember. All I know is Brett got me out. That was a nightmare. Um, yeah. it, was, it, it was, it was, it was bloody. That was actually a horrible experience because you know Brett was so excited to be playing at that level. But I'm, I'm the incumbent. I'm, I'm in the Australian team and. And of course, straight away, as soon as I came to bat, they brought Brett on. And going through your mind is, what do I do to my younger brother here? Do I try and smash him? But he might get me out. No, I yeah. know. Oh, I'll, I'll just try and knock him around. Tailed in two minds and got out. You know, <laughs> it was a disaster. But as, as, you, as I chipped one, I think to, to cover, I, I just hear everyone laughing. This is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> the laughing's the worst part. Is that like? I mean, yeah, play, yeah. Pl- playing that year, just to harp on that point of like how good like a, cr- yeah. a cricket academy side is that they put them against the Australian team. Was it was it just really well known that like they've just got this crop of this this generational talent, best ever team possibly coming through? Was that was that known at the time? Um, I don't know. Um, being being in part of it, um, there were some really serious players. That, mm. that the one guy from pretty much New South Wales under 17s right through that I knew was going to be a superstar was Adam Gilchrist. Mm-hmm. Um, everything, everything, and it was just from, from a from a timing perspective when, you know, Healy was going to be sort of retiring potentially if he, right. he played for that long. Um, Gilly would be the right age to take over, and he, and he did. So, you know, he was a superstar batsman. But, you know, he had guys like Andrew Simons, as you said, was just a great cricketer. Um, and guys guys in, in that era too, like guys that don't get a lot of mentions, like guys like Mark Love, who was just the hardest guy to bowl yeah. to in the world. Jimmy Ma, you know, Queensland, and, and, and some really, really good um, – you know, down the cricket academy, we had uh, uh, Brian Campbell. Um, yeah, some really, really good cricketers. Mm. That was tough as well. Can we can we talk a little bit about that uh, New South Wales versus Australia player dynamic? Like, you know, when the when the Test players came back into the side, what was that dynamic? I mean, we saw the other day with the Blues winning the Shield, the uh, Test players were on the top deck of the ladies stand, and the uh, <laughs> the non Test players at the bottom deck for that photo shoot. Was it like that as well? No, it wasn't at all. No, that um, but the, the Tubby was, um, and 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 the wars are all really inclusive, um, and and they wanted to win. Whenever they played New South Wales, they wanted to win, so that was infectious. Um, and you know they, they had a real attitude. I remember Steve Waugh sort of saying what one game in I think it was in Adelaide where he declared, and basically we had to bolt South Australia around Adelaide Oval for a hundred and twenty or less. And he said, if none of you guys don't fucking believe we can win. Don't bother following me out here. So it was that sort of attitude, and like, Jesus Christ, and, and we won that game. Gavin Robinson bowled, bowled, bowled him out. So, um, yeah, it was really, really infectious. It was always good fun to hang around too. And, and yeah, that, that was the sort of era where cricketers sort of became, you know, really well known. It was, they were high profile. You know, Slats was, you know, mm. on TV. You had Warney and these sort of guys. So it was, um, yeah, that was a bit, bit more, a bit, a bit of a rock star sort of attitude, which was good. Mm. In that era as well, there was obviously like the back in the day when they used to put, um, the state games, the Mercantile Mutual Cup, as it were, uh, on, yeah, on Channel yeah. 9 at the time. And, of course, the big thing, the big thing that everyone, every player wanted to do, all the fans wanted to see was hit the Mercantile Mutual Cup sign, the pinnacle of any state or international cricketer at the time. Shane Lee did that down the ground against the ACT, yeah. hit the sign, $90,000 won. First of all, I mean, how fucking big is that circuit as soon as that hits? And then <laughs> apparently apparently at the time as well that Mercantile Mutual wanted to have a hole in the sign. And if a player hit That's it right. through that – they were going to get a million dollars, but then the cricket uh, uh, ACB said, "Nah, don't do that." So anyway, uh, that's a that's, that's just an aside. I mean, just how fucking big was that circuit chain in the ACT mm-hmm. that night? <laughs> well, it, it was quite big. But um, so Steve Waugh was the first one to hit it. He was one hundred forty thousand dollars, which I actually played in that game as well. That was in Perth. Yeah. And Steve, Steve was the first one to hit. So his formula to divide the money up was, I think, he was each player that played in that match, so ninety percent was split twelve ways. Um, and then 10, 10% was given like pro rata to the guys that played games throughout the year. So, uh, you know, I probably made bloody, remember 10 grand or something out of, out of that nice little uh, game <laughs> over in Perth. Oh. But I couldn't remember what I actually spent my money on years, a couple of years down the track. So when I hit it, I came off and went, you know what? 
I'm going to take the whole squad, including the, the masseuse, which is Merv Serres, I'm going to take the coaches, and the whole 25 guys in the New South Wales squad, we're all going to Hawaii, it's one of the biggest vendors of all time. Oh, my uh, God. And Michael Bevan actually complained to Cricket New South Wales because under Steve Waugh's formula, he would have missed out on uh, about 700 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> we need Bevan on this show. <laughs> A lot of money, no, I, was asked to go in, I was asked to go into New South Wales cricket, and they, they sort of said, Shane, we can't tell you what to do with the money, but we strongly suggest you don't do that. You use Steve Orr's formula. And I was sort of pressured into doing it. And I, unfortunately, I, I, I gave in and, um, and, and did that. But um, I regret that now. I should have went to Hawaii. Oh, fuck I, I, yeah. I should have said, I'll get the bloody light, you know. But um, mm. anyway, <laughs> thanks for that. Just, just pocket the 90 grand. That would have been good. Yeah, good point. That was <laughs> 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 Feel the regret through that laugh as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a single tear yeah, running yeah, yeah. down his, his cheek. Yeah. Um, just in terms of test selection, Shane, like you, you went very close a couple of times, um, noting you're on the 97 Ashes tour. Like It, it must have been tough to miss out on playing a test. Um, but yeah. uh, what was it like touring with Warney? <laughs> <laughs> It was magnificent. That was great fun. No, it was it was it was got down to the last it was the last county game. Mark Taylor basically I got called up from just league cricket and there was a guy called Sean Young from Tasmania. He yeah. was playing for Gloucester. And Mark Taylor said, Listen, I, I know you both can bat and basically whoever scores takes the most wickets in this last county game will play the fifth test. And you know, I, and I thought, Come at the hour, come at the man yeah. and um so I didn't go out with Warney that night and I got I got an early one and uh and I, and I took eight wickets for the match, and Sean Young got none, and, and Tubby picked Sean Young. So, bloody hell. I should have went out with Warney. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Fuck. It's outrageous. Did he give you any explanation yeah. for that? Oh, I, I, just thought, I just thought that he thought I was a bit young, and, and he didn't want me to, to earn the baggy green that easy, and he thought I could get another chance down the track, which I never did. So, yeah, that was unfortunate. But the good thing is I, I knew that when I was asked and told to perform – um, yeah, to, to get that chance, at least I know that I did. So, um, yeah, it wasn't the beat. It is what it is. I just feel like in that era, like, Shane, that sort of everyone hung out a bit more, you know, I feel like there was more sort of bonding between the teams. I guess you were playing maybe a little bit less because they're just playing endlessly all the yeah. time now, you know. But I, I, I want to know, like, like, after the games, like, were people coming into the dressing room, sharing a beer? Like, were the umpires involved? What I'm asking is, what's Daryl Hare like as a bloke? <laughs> Well, Big D, you can't call him no bull, can he? Um, <laughs> Big, Big D. D. <laughs> Big D. I was called Big D. Yeah. <laughs> Big D, yeah. Big D. Well, Big Double D. Um, no, he, um, well, I remember we, we had another guy called, uh, I can't remember his name, we called him Merlin, Merlin of the position. He was, uh, he was an umpire for South Wales. He had, had the big silver beard. And, and we were playing against South Australia one day at the SCG, and he was a New South Wales umpire. And I remember I bowled a perfect, um, the ball was reverse swing, I bowled a perfect ball to Jamie Siddons, it was absolutely plum. And bloody Merlin, Merlin, our umpire, said not out. So then we said, you've got to be joking, Merlin. Why, why would that, that, that could not be missing. And he goes, Phil, I thought it was just missing leg, but don't worry, we are going all right. We are going to win. <laughs> <laughs> We're working hard here, boys. We're going to get through this. One brings two. And I just grabbed the cap and walked back to the top of the mark and just said that no problem at all. And we won the game. <laughs> I bet you did. I bet you did. Ian <laughs> oh. Jackson was his name, actually. Ian Jackson. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, name right. him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Still up behind. <laughs> uh, Shane, uh, 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 we have to ask about six and out, obviously. Um mm. Sort of done a little bit of digging with this. I mean, I guess I just want to know. Obviously, the the band is great. Gavin Robertson's a fantastic drummer. I've heard that before. I, I do want to know about what happens after those shows because you guys are still playing, still well known as you're going out and playing those shows. Richard Cheekwe asked us to um, inquire about what happened in Cairns, especially where things happen in threes. Oh Jesus, yeah. So um, yeah, so we, we had like a residency at it's called Jono's Blues Bar in Cairns, which means we're playing for about five nights in a row. Um, and so the, the John's Blues Bar was on the corner. Across the road was our hotel. And on the other corner was this fantastic Italian restaurant. And I used to call it the Beer Muta Triangle because we'd have beers at the gig. We'd go back to the hotel, sleep, wake up, go have a little lunch, and go straight to the gig. So the Beer Muta Triangle was every day. So the thing I thought happened in three. So Brett said um, on the, after the first hangover, he said, come on, guys, let's have a run around and um, uh, play a bit of touch footy. 
and we had a supporting band with us who were actually better than us, <laughs> which was embarrassing. <laughs> but that, that, they had a big lead singer. He sang with Shane as well, this big muscly guy. And uh, so we're playing touch football, and this big clumsy lead singer called Shane from our support band trips over and fucking dead legs me and like corks my legs. <laughs> and I said, guys, I'm not doing anything. Well, well, this is rock and roll. We don't we don't do cricket and bloody football we up here. Anyway, so as we were walking back, and I was, oh, I was limping. Um, there were these kids playing cricket in the park and they noticed Brett and I and they said, oh, boy, can you come and... So I said, oh, bat. So I Brett's bowling with a tennis ball and I hooked Brett into the sort of muddy water there in Cairns. <laughs> and I, we didn't see Brett pick the ball up. It was covered in mud. And the next ball he bowled, and I, I just had a pair of shorts with no undies on. So I've got a cork leg and he bowls this ball and it fucking skids and hits me right, right in the nuts, right? And just drops this. So I've got a big muddy... Muddy patch on my ball and, and a full leg, and I said, "That's it, boys. We're going to lunch. We're at a gig tonight." So I hobbled over to hobbled over to lunch, and as I um, ordered a prawn dish, I squeezed the prawn tail and it fucking shot out as well and cut, cut my whole nose. So, so now I've, I've got a bleeding oh nose. I've got, I've got a full leg, and I've got sore ball. Anyway, so I thought things happened at three. And we played the gig that night and, and finished the gig. and went to another pub. And this band asked us to go and play one song, and the one song I can always play when I'm totally hammered is, is Blister in the Sun. So I get up on stage, and the guy says to me, oh, you can use my guitar, but you're not too drunk, are you, Shane? I said, no, I'll be fine, mate. And it was just sort of like, um, I don't know, pipes that went across the roof and down the stage, and I, I thought it was a pole, but it was actually just a, a pretty hollow <laughs> bit of material. <laughs> and I tried to lean back onto this you know, inverted corner pole, and I fell straight through the drum kit. It's like, <laughs> took out Gavin Leverton. Stabbed myself on the high hat and like, just ended up on the ground. Totally, yeah. But things happen in fours, yeah. It was a uh, nightmare ever done that. <laughs> still playing. Yeah. <laughs> it's rock and roll. It's rock and roll. Um, and Shane, also, just just before we wrap up, you've started your own uh, podcast as well, Lunch with Lee. You've had a, a plenty of fantastic guests on as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? The thrust of it is—is it—is it, is it lunchtime stories like if you were going to Lee's Fortuna Court in Crow's Nest uh, over a few beers and anything else that Stanley offers, uh, or um, or is it a little bit more serious than that? No, no, it's, it's um, well, I thought, how do I get paid to go to lunch? So I think I've cracked it, boy. So yeah, it's called lunch with Lee. Um, and the three things that I've had in my life, well, I've experienced have been sport, music, and business. So I try and have on every show either a sportsman and a business person or a sportsman and a musician. Um, so the one that comes out today is with Guy Sebastian and Ed Cowan, the, the test cricketer. Um, and the idea is we, we just talk, it's, 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 uh, it's short stories and over a long lunch um, with a few good yarns. But the underlying thing that I try and encompass is a bit about mental health. I think as as blokes, we pretty much always self-diagnose and uh, we think we're invincible, which we probably are, but uh, but not always. And um, we're certainly having a good laugh over over and uh, you know, breaking some breaking some bread and having a nice meal and and, and telling a few good stories. That's good fun. Oh, so that's awesome. lunch with Lee. So, well, Shane, thanks so much. You've, you've brought uh, a tremendous number of stories, as we asked. <laughs> so we're really, uh, really grateful for that. Thanks for your time and uh, all the best with lunch with Lee and everything else beyond. Yeah. Hey, can you ask Bev for my 700 bucks back as well, please? <laughs> well, we've only DM'd him three times to come on the show yeah. for no reply. Yeah. So. <laughs> See you later, mate. See you, boys. See you later, mate. See you, mate. He goes, great to hear from Zach Crawley and Shane Lee, two players from two different eras, both with a lot of grade cricket pedigree now, Pez, in their own way. Now, what happens if Zach Crawley falls through for some reason? Because we've given a lot of air time and – from time to time, mm. things do happen where something falls through, recording doesn't happen, you know, they don't give a fuck anymore. You know, these things can happen. So if he's not on the show, mm. that's on him. It's on him. <laughs> it's never our fault. I mean, I felt so dirty I saying, mean, wasn't it great to hear from Zach Crawley? We haven't, heard, we haven't fucking heard from him. I don't know what he's like. Yeah. What if, I, what if he says something really mean? Mm. Gee, it was great to chat with him. It was nice uh, to talk to him, actually. Uh Time to talk about our great friends at Budget Smuggling. Now, I've been – look, they're doing face masks. They're still doing face masks. Oh, and they will be. And you're going to need it really till 2025 if the Reddit rumours to be. <laughs> Believe. You've been going down some Reddit rabbit holes recently. Yes. Uh, 4chan, that sort of uh, gear. Yeah. I, I want to focus again on great feuds, right, for your, for your custom design yes. uh, face masks. Right. Okay. So we heard this week or last yeah. week the suggestion, and Donald Trump agreed with it, mm that Joe Rogan actually host or mediate a yeah, debate between right. Joe Biden that's right. and Donald Trump. So could you just get – I'm starting to think of great feuds that could be hosted. Yeah. Okay. Biden versus Trump on Rogan. Yep. 
What feuds could we host on the grade cricketer to put things to bed once for once and for all? Warn and war. Easy. Bang. Yep. Straight up. Yep. Chappelle and Botham. Okay? Yep. Clark and Kadich. Yep. CIA Assange. <laughs> Establishment media versus friendly Geordies. <laughs> Few thoughts. McGrath saw one. <laughs> on both on the same by the same token. We're just trying to trigger some ideas for, for custom design face masks. For I you would guys. like to mediate any of those discussions. Yes. Which the most though? Ooh. Clark Kadich. Warren Warfare, man. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm just, I was trying to go hipster's choice yeah, because yeah. that's the obvious answer. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't give a fuck about anyone else. I just want to see how tight Steve Walker can keep his mouth when he talks <laughs> and how much it, words escape out of the side. He doesn't need a budgie's yeah. like a face mask. He doesn't yeah. need one. Those lips are sealed. Shane Lee again, just just more more Steve Walker imagery. Mate, just this, talking. This, this bloke, this, this bloke's just to- Oh, man, I don't know. He just, it just, that was a flashback. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I mean, I never – did you ever play – no, you wouldn't have played against Shane Lee. I did, actually. He did. Once, yeah. Uh, Norse versus Mossman. Yeah. Because Shane Lee retired at 29 because of his bad yeah. knees. And he was still – I don't know why he was playing. It was an absolute road. Playing four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Three yeah. of our guys scored hundreds and I got run out for 30. Job done. No, not really. Tori actually came back from a, being away for eight weeks. I've told this story before as well. I was walking around giving, you know, doing a lap, and I was throwing away 100 there. And then she said, hey, Pez, I'm back. And I was still furious. Oh, and my she God. she went to surprise me. Yeah. Anyway, we got married, had kids. Hard to get out of that, head, out of that headspace, yeah. Anyway, budgie smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> you can use the code CHAMP for free shipping. Yes. CHAMP for free shipping. Budgiesmuggler.com. Pezzy lad. You. Hashtag ICGC. Mm. Many great questions coming in, especially towards the back end of the UK summer. Mm. And to our UK friends out there, hopefully you stick with us because you yourself, your national team will be touring. You've got, some, you've got, you've got Schlenker going on, you've got some Indian stuff. Mm. You, you, know, you obviously want to know how we've Vesto's. We've got more UK guests lined up, here goes. We, but people want to know how Bearso is going to go when he's playing for his IPL team. Are you across who's where? I just, I'm barely sort across of. the teams, man. Sort of. Like, and we will be covering the IPL in depth because it's basically the only cricket that's happening. So, mm. you know. Will we? Okay. <clears throat> we can cover some great stuff like Channel 7 want us to. They're going to start covering some great games. Yeah, I, t- I took what Warburton said at face value. <laughs> he said we'll do it for free. I'm like, okay, we'll wait, we'll wait till we talk to you. JW. J-Dub. Warbs. Warbs. Fuck me. Joel Roberts writes in. He says, Ian, Sam, hmm. I'm not sure whether it's having <laughs> just listened to Pez's seven-minute ode on shaving his balls or the fact that having recently signed to your Patreon, you're compelled to read this out. There's three commas for you, he goes, but I'm implored to write for some advice. Mm-hmm. I am six years clean from playing cricket. I'm a 29-year-old Englishman living in Sydney. No, not in recruitment, but actually for a company that Ed Cowan's firm is invested in. And my last game was for my village side two days before flying over here in June 2014. You wouldn't say I had an illustrious career. You wouldn't say I had an illustrious playing career. My, my, my play cricket stats show I averaged 20-odd, 13.44, took 30 wickets and have a couple of stumpings over my 10-plus seasons at a pretty low standard. In fact, that's the type of player I was. I could do everything kind of okay. However, that final game, I went out on the high. I went in at number five, getting, in, getting out in the final over, scoring my highest ever total of 80. I then took a catch as a wicketkeeper before being asked to take off the pads to, to turn my arm over, staring two wickets in a seven-wicket defeat. Sitting in the dressing room after the game whilst muttering, done my job, out the side of my mouth, I thought to myself, does it get any better than this? I had gone out on a high, about to relocate to an exceptional country, and never had to see these cunts again or play this sport again. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I'm a cricket tragic. I let it deprive me of sleep, not just the World Cup, but even the, even the Windies playing India in test matches. Fuck me. I went to three Ashes tests in 1718 and even went to the Warner Smith game at Coogee Oval when Watto peppered the houses. Mm. However... For the first time since 2014 Swan Song, that itch has returned. How come now I have the urge, how come I have this urge to put the pads back on? What has recently changed? Answer, the grade cricketer. I've followed your content for a while, but it's only really in the last 12 months that I've become an avid listener. Whilst there's obviously huge differences between Sydney and Sydney Test Cricket and the village tripe I played, there's also a lot of relatability. Anxiety about showering with grown men, bowling off 18 yards and nets at one of the club's ship blokes, okay, occasional camaraderie, Bez is bouncing along, please, occasional camaraderie because you're actually playing a team full of bigger pricks than yours, and of course, anxiety around showering with grown, grown men. men. <laughs> I, even, I even recommended the cast to my brother, though that's mainly because he lived with Johnny Bear, so at uni for a year, and so I thought it might help in getting him on as, as a guest some fucking how. 
So why now am I getting Stockholm Syndrome? Why do I get this? Why do I get the completely false feeling that the only thing holding back my medium pace was the slow English wickets? And so now is the time to unleash my erratic arm on Australia. I know I'm shit. I know I'll hate it. But the grey cricketer has whet my appetite for playing. Whet my appetite for playing. <laughs> I had a net the other week. Mm. Was I good? No. But but was that my ability, or was it because I was using I was using left handed gloves? <laughs> Why does cricket have this mental hold on me? What have you, yes, you two personally done? I was happy going to the beach on the weekends, and now I'm asking my Aussie mate about potential clubs. Ugh. <laughs> was, that, was that correct onomatopoeia? You did it, yeah. So what I really want to know is why, two days after signing up to your Patreon, are the Commonwealth Bank fraud team calling me up to ask about a series of suspicious transactions across Asia? Cheers, Joel Roberts. Well, that's a fine question, Joel. It's a fine question. Well, <laughs> it's a fine 10 questions. I literally counted them. It's a world record 10 questions in an RSTGC. <laughs> that's it. It's 10 a, separate questions it's a for us to answer there. It's yeah. a so let's just pick out the, the thrust of it. Why this, don't we talk about something else? This, yeah, like as we usually normally do. do. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Yeah. Just Stornis at 52 of 20 in the I IPL. thought he looked pretty good, yeah, actually. Yeah. Your arms are big at the end. Yeah. That's right. Good to see Donny back as well. More bingo. Uh, he goes, This is a Joel's got a nostalgia problem. Yes. He's got a nostalgia problem. Yes. So looking this up, if we – this is a bit of scientific stuff here from some blog off Google. Um, right. If we feel nostalgic too often, it's likely a sign that something is not working right in our lives. Excessive nostalgia can be related to problems such as decreased performance, mm-hmm. concentration problems, insomnia, depression, or even affect our physical well-being. I start looking back at the past, you know, looking at it through roast into spectacles because – the present's not going that well for us. Um, nonetheless, from a treatment perspective, reports suggest that personal nostalgia can be used therapeutically to help individuals move beyond trauma uh, in the aftermath of violence, exile, or loss. So, again, think about this in a cricket context. And I always do. Um, anyway, it goes into some other actual medical stuff about it, which is boring. Um, no, no <laughs> doubt, as opposed to what I just read of a blog, which is highly entertaining. More Reddit stuff? Uh, he goes, he's hit 80 in his last match, and then that has become the blueprint for what cricket could be again. We've heard this time and time again. His last game was good. He's listened a little bit about cricket and thought, that's the last time I played. That's what happened. Ergo, that's what will happen beyond. I feel sorry for Joel because he's already sucked in. It's happening. He's decided he needs to go and scratch the itch. He's playing. He's playing. And it's going to be a horrendous experience He's batting with like a left-handed glass, yeah. but he knows the pain's about to happen. He's going to lose five he's, years of his life. He's also dis- – <laughs> just through sun damage. <laughs> just He's also disassociated himself from the, from the pain, though, because he knows it's bad, but he's forgotten how bad it can be. Mm. Like a bad day of cricket, keep saying this over and over again, but I will continue to do so for another 128 episodes, is that a bad day of cricket is a fucking bad day. Bad day of football, bad day of golf, bad day of tennis. They're, they're different things. Those, those, are still, those are still enjoyable pursuits. A bad day of cricket is one of the worst days of your life and the anxiety-driven pain that can be caused from that is just – I don't know how you can forget it. Not to mention sunburn. Not to mention sunburn. You have a bad day playing football, you still probably got fitter. Yeah, and you, you, know probably, I mean? you probably had a couple of nice touches. The team yeah. might have won. That's a good result. You can go to cricket and be, oh, well, that's, you know, I'm outside um, doing an outdoor pursuit, yeah. uh, doing sport. You, you can decrease your health physically, yeah. mentally, spiritually, yeah. emotionally yeah. through a day's play of cricket. You can, you can get out for nothing, eat a shit ton of tea, become fatter. People are sledging you. Uh, you get abused. It, 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 there's no upside to it. You're not getting better as a person. Or you know by by developing some kind of resilience to to this trauma, hey, Pez, and then you get sunburned. What about what about you know hanging out with your teammates, hanging out with your friends? Oh yeah, that's right. Then you then you win the toss and you bat and you're batting down at six. Yeah. Holding partnerships going well, and you think hmm, I'm not going to bat today because the wicket's flat. Yeah. And then someone in your team will be like some a woman will walk past and, and he'll say five out of ten, oh, and, ten and you'll yeah. just go oh, yeah, for that's fuck, my mum for fuck's sake. This is eight eight more hours of this plus next yeah, weekend. Exactly. Someone's reading the you know uh, punning pages or whatever. Mm. You know your dad's got a gambling problem. You don't really want to talk about it. You try and open a broadsheet to read some business stuff. People think you're a fucking rare unit or whatever. Or well, how'd you go on your HSC? Oh, I did quite well. Oh, like this guy thinks he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> the whole just endless. It just doesn't end. You know. <laughs> Who the fuck's this bloke? Fuck out of here. Anyway, Joel, yeah. let's know how you get on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a good day out, mate. It's been a long show. We'll see how we go with this. Charlie Moss. Now, we've heard from Charlie Moss Yes, before. we have. Charlie Moss. Charlie Moss. Charlie Moss was the guy who wrote in about um, playing against the blind, uh, blind England England women's blind team. Yeah. And is that then, on Patreon now? 
Maybe. No, 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 it wasn't. Oh, it? No, it wasn't. Oh. No, it was in the free show. Okay. Charlie Moss, thanks for the airtime, gents. Off topic, but on brand. I've also played football against a deaf team. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a theme here, Charlie. Something wrong with this. Play. Is, <laughs> he's, now, he's we've always it. said we'll never kink shame on this show. No, but if your kink is no. to, I've hooked up with a, I've hooked up with a deaf bird in the in a bar. Right, in the let's UK. keep reading this. Yeah, how was it? Oh, uh, unusual, because it was loud in the club, and then, but she was really good at lip reading. I was less so. I had the problems. Off topic, but on brand. I've also played football against a deaf team. When we first set up our side, we had to enter into the lowest division and at the bottom of that league with nowhere to be relegated to was a deaf football club. It seemed... <laughs> <laughs> the pain on your face. Just control. It seemed wholesome, broad age range, community spirit, smiles all around, a worthy cause we can all be supportive of. Transpired, they were the biggest bunch of cunts we've ever played against, <laughs> diving, elbows, stamping the works. They lost 5-0 every week. We were top of the league. We'll moonwalk through this one. Then we went 1-0 down for 80 fucking minutes. This can't be happening. What am I going to tell Dad when he asks how we got on? He wasn't there. How do we look our opponents in the eye the following week when they've seen we lost to this lot? In the midst of the panic, my centre-half partner claimed that their striker would be world-class if he could hear. (laughs) What? Deaf or otherwise, they were rubbish. We finally woke up, scored twice late on and won the game 2-1. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. (laughs) (laughs) That's just saying that after a late winner against (laughs) a deaf team. (laughs) I believe it was Martin Luther (laughs) King Jr., the king. I'm now 31. When should I stop beating disabled people at sport? That's a fine. Cheers, that's a fine question, Charlie. But it does strike me. He's saying that's a fine. That is a fine. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two fingers. Um, the uh, it strikes me as like you would have played in teams pairs that weren't very good, and then you'll have a captain in that team who'll just be like, "Well, let's just fucking bump them," basically in, in a cricketing sense. And it's the same in like other sports where like you just be more physical. Yeah, you, know, you see this in football all the time. If you're not very skilled, you'll just fucking kick people. Basically, I'm not sure if you played those kind of games, but and that's what's happening here. This deaf team is obviously that's that's how they get their enjoyment. Yeah. You, know, you know, teams in teams in a cricket. Oh, just to, just to pivot this back to a cricketing sense for our loyal listeners out there who care more about that, perhaps. But you know, those teams that like struggle, and they win like one or two games a year, and they suck. But they they seem to get the enjoyment out of the um, out of winning some sort of moral battle where they're just the biggest, they're just real big cunts, mm. and that makes them feel better about themselves. It's yeah. kind of like small man syndrome a little bit, yeah. who like they try to exude their masculinity and their virility by being ultra aggressive, and it's a little bit like. Hmm. Mm. Why are you doing that? Because yeah. you're not very good. Mm. And then the whole experience just is really tainted. Then it's not you don't enjoy betting that team. Although some people seem to, you know, really thrive in that environment. I, I really I, enjoy that. You really enjoy that? Oh, like are you saying if you're a normal person who yeah. beats up on teams who have got some weird alpha ego shit going on? Yeah, I like that because I I find them invariably get quite angry and then turn on each other and you just a lot of their issues off the field come out on the field and I just get off on that. Yeah, okay. So you have like some sort of superiority complex. You're a megalomaniac. I don't know. He's like, oh, you're trying to alpha me. You're trying to do all this like uh, strange emotional thing that's more about you and your upbringing or whatever and you're like trying to like abuse me me? or whatever. And, you you know, you always do this to me. (laughs) But invariably. I said we wouldn't talk about this on the show. (laughs) You always do this. Let's not fight. But then like, you know, yeah, and thinking that some big bloke stepped past him and we're playing touch footy. Yeah, okay. And you just see see the pain, the anguish on the face, you know, it's like, I don't oh, like I don't, I don't like confrontation. I I hate it. Oh. So I just But I was really lucky. I never really got sledged in my great career. I was really lucky. Mm. Probably because I'm such a big alpha. <laughs> We're gonna have to edit that out of the show. <laughs> uh, your your face just then again for those who watch on the YouTube, you seem to morph into like the um Jim Carrey's the mask there. Steve was my idol. One more, Pez? Do we have time for one more? Do we? Long show. Yeah, I got a couple of guests. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't. We'll save. We'll save them. We'll save them for another day. Thank you, Charlie. Save them. And thank you, <laughs> thank you, Joel. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Pezzy lad. We'll see you guys for the patrons. We'll see you during the week. For the rest of you, we'll see you guys next time.